Hello, this is revision for OCR Gateway P1B, keeping homes warm. We will be covering insulating homes, conduction, convection and radiation, payback time, efficiency and Sankey diagrams. As we've already mentioned, the direction of flow of heat energy is always from hot to cold. But there are in fact three ways in which heat can travel, by conduction, convection and radiation. We're going to look at all three. We'll start with conduction. Conduction happens in solids, and metals in particular are very good conductors of heat. That is sufficient if you're studying foundation. If you are studying for higher tier, then have a look at this diagram at the bottom as well. The diagram zooms in on this uh, bar of metal and it shows us the particles inside. Now, as the particles are heated by the flame, they gain kinetic energy, their kinetic energy increases, their vibration increases, and their temperature rises. As particles collide with the particles next to them, their vibrational energy or their kinetic energy is passed on. Metals are particularly good conductors of heat because they contain these things called free electrons. They are electrons that can move around the metal and are not attached to any one particular atom. As the metal is heated, these free electrons gain energy and can move around very quickly. As they collide with other metal atoms further away from the heat source, they transfer their kinetic energy to that atom and make that particular atom start vibrating. In this way, free electrons can transfer kinetic energy from one atom to another very quickly. This is why metals are particularly good conductors of heat. The key thing to remember about conduction is that it involves the transfer of kinetic energy between particles. So on to convection. Convection is the main method of heat transfer in liquids and gases, collectively known as fluids. For high tier, you need to know the detail of a convection current, which is what we are concerned with in this diagram down here. The radiator in the room is heating the air surrounding it. As the air heats up, it expands. When it's expanded, it takes up more space, so it's become less dense. That makes it lighter than all of the air around it, so the hot air starts to rise. It's important to remember that it's the air that becomes less dense, not the particles. The particles of the air don't change. Once the air travels further from the radiator, it starts to cool. Cool air contracts. You can think of the particles huddling together like penguins. It contracts, it becomes more dense and heavier than the surrounding air, and so sinks. So what we get is a convection current. I'll recap that. Warm air expands, become less dense than rises. Cool air contracts, becomes more dense and sinks. So now on to heat radiation. But all hot objects radiate heat. Radiated heat is actually another name for infrared radiation. Remember, this is what was used in our thermal imaging to make thermograms. Infrared is actually part of this thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. And we're going to come on to this more later on in the topic. Of the three methods of heat transfer, conduction, convection and radiation, radiation is actually the odd one out. Conduction and convection both need particles in order to work. Radiation doesn't need any medium to travel. That means it doesn't have to travel through anything. It's actually the only method of heat transfer that can occur in a vacuum. And it's because of this that heat energy can travel from the sun through space to the earth. Certain colours and surfaces are very good at reflecting infrared radiation, whilst others are very good at absorbing it, taking it in, and emitting it, giving it out. The sorts of surfaces that reflect infrared radiation are shiny silver surfaces, whilst dark, dull or black surfaces are good at absorbing and emitting infrared radiation, that means soaking it up and giving it out. That's why in very hot countries you might find houses that are painted white to reflect the heat energy from the sun, the infrared radiation from the sun. This picture shows a photocell. This would be positioned on the roof of a house and these pipes would have water running through them. The pipes are painted black so that they absorb as much infrared radiation as possible 
and that heat energy is then passed on to the water. So this is actually a method of heating water using solar energy. I'm going to talk now about how we can insulate our homes. Now the good news is that most insulation works in the same way. It works by trapping a layer of air. Trapped air is a very poor conductor which makes it a good insulator. This picture here shows some ways in which heat energy can be lost from the house through the roof, through windows, door, through the walls. And we, we're going to talk about ways in which the heat lost through each of these ways can be reduced. So loft insulation, you may have seen this up in your attic or your loft. It works by trapping air. You can see this is lots of layers of kind of woolly fibre, it's actually called fibreglass and inside there are lots and lots of pockets of air. As I've mentioned, this is placed in the loft, so it's going to reduce the heat energy lost through the roof by conduction. We know that it's reducing conduction because the heat energy will be lost through a solid. How does heat travel through a solid? It travels by conduction. Double glazing, so this is reducing the heat energy lost through the window. Again, it works by trapping a layer of air. Using double glazing reduces the heat lost through the window by conduction. On to cavity wall insulation. Most houses, other than sort of older Victorian houses, ha actually have two layers of brick. They have this layer of brick that you can see on the outside of the house, but on the inside of the house they have this layer of breeze blocks. You can't actually see them because they're covered in plaster and paint and wallpaper and whatever, but they are there. Now, when they were built, a lot of houses were built with a gap between them. This is the cavity. Cavity is the gap or the space. Now, without any filling, the air inside that cavity is free to circulate. And that can lead to heat loss. Let's have a look at how. If this is the inside of our house, nice and warm, and this is the outside of our house, a bit cooler. The heat energy from the inside of the house travels through that inside layer of brick by conduction. The air next to that wall gains heat energy, expands, becomes less dense and rises. As it travels over this way, it cools down, becomes more dense and sinks. So we get a convection current going on inside here. This convection current is actually transferring heat energy from this inside layer of the brick to the outside layer of the brick. The air here is cooling down because it's transferring some of its heat energy to the particles in the brick. That heat energy is then transferred by conduction through the brick and is then transferred to the air outside of the house. So to overcome this, we can put a layer of cavity wall insulation between those two layers of brick. That can be fiberglass, as shown here, or it could be foam that's injected into the cavity. Inside that insulation, of course, is our trapped air. Once the air inside the cavity is trapped, it can no longer move, so it prevents the convection current from being set up. And as we know, trapped air is also a poor conductor, so heat energy can't be lost via conduction through the cavity. There would still be some heat loss, and another way of reducing this is to use foil inside the cavity. By putting a layer of foil either side of the insulation, you can also reduce the heat loss by radiation. Okay, here are some other methods of home insulation if you're studying for the foundation tier. Curtains, again, trap a layer of air, that's our key phrase. They reduce heat loss by conduction through the window. You can put foil behind radiators. What this does is it reflects the radiated heat back into the room. That reduces the heat loss by conduction through the walls. And then these two pictures down here show draft proofing. You can see there's like a rubber seal on the bottom of the door and some bristles inside the letterbox there. Uh, using draft proofing reduces the heat loss by convection. There are many different things that we can do in the home to save energy and we need to know which ones are worth doing and which ones aren't. 
One of the ways of assessing cost effectiveness is this idea of payback time. The payback time tells you how long it takes to make back the initial money that you spent on something, how long it takes to get that back in your savings. And you can see the equation here to work it out. Payback time is equal to the initial cost divided by the annual saving. Let's have a look at an example. If it costs £3,000 to install double glazing, the annual saving on fuel bills is £120. What's the payback time for double glazing? So to work that out, we're calculating the payback time. The initial cost is £3,000. The annual saving is £120. We plug that into our calculator, cancel the zeros there, plug that into our calculator, and we get an answer of 25 years. This is the only equation that you're not given in that front cover on your exam paper, so you do need to know this one. This diagram here is called a Sankey diagram, and it's used to illustrate energy transfers. This is a Sankey diagram for a light bulb. So we can see that for every 100 joules of electrical energy put in, we get 75 joules of useful light energy and 25 joules of energy wasted as heat. We can use this diagram to work out the efficiency. The efficiency is the useful energy that we get out of something divided by the total energy put in. So we're working out which fraction of the energy put in is useful. You'll see in our example that when we're calculating the efficiency, you can either leave your answer as a value between 0 and 1, or you can multiply it by 100 to convert it to a percent. If you're converting it into a percentage, then you need to show your units, otherwise your answer will be judged incorrect. OK, so let's take a look at an example now. For every 150 joules of electrical energy transferred, a light bulb produces 110 joules of light energy. Calculate the efficiency of the bulb. We've got our equation up here, so I'm not going to write it out again. We can just go straight to substituting in values. So I'll write E for efficiency is equal to the useful energy out. Now it's a light bulb, so the useful energy out is light energy. And we've got 110 joules of light energy given here. So I'm going to do 110 divided by our total energy in, which is 150 joules of electrical energy. So I have 110 divided by 150, or if I cancel, 11 divided by 15, which is equal to 0.7 to one decimal place. Now I can either leave my answer as a decimal or I can multiply it by 100 to give a percentage. So if I'm going to calculate my percentage I would say 0 0.7 times 100 which equals 70%. Your answer for an efficiency calculation should either be between 0 and 1 if you're leaving it as a decimal or between 0 and 100% if you're quoting it as a percentage. If your answer is above 1 or above 100%, you've done something wrong. It doesn't make sense that you could have something that is more than 100% efficient. It means that it's actually producing more energy than it puts in, which doesn't make sense. If you're studying for the higher tier, you might need to calculate something other than the efficiency. You might need to calculate the useful energy or the energy in. You might want to pause this now and try and write the equation in a triangle yourself to test yourself before you watch me do it. Okay, so here we go. Remember, if something is above the line in the equation, then it has to go above the line in the triangle. That means we need to put the useful energy at the top, that leaves us with the efficiency and the energy in at the bottom. Right, so let's have a go at writing two other forms of this equation. Again, you can pause this now and have a go yourself before you watch me do it. 
So if we're asked to calculate the useful energy, we cover that up and we see that that's the efficiency multiplied by the energy in. If we want to write another expression for the energy in, then we cover that up and we're left with useful energy divided by the efficiency. All right, so now we'll look at another example where we have to use the same equation, but we have to change the subject of the equation. So a car engine is 38% efficient. What is the useful kinetic energy output for each 30 kilojoules of chemical energy input from the fuel? And then part two, draw a Sankey diagram to illustrate the energy transfers. Okay, so to answer question one, we first of all, we start off by writing out the equation, and it's the equation that you'd find on the inside cover of the front of your exam paper. And the equation is the efficiency is equal to the useful energy divided by the total energy in. And this example, we're not actually asked to calculate the efficiency, we're given the efficiency we are asked to calculate the useful kinetic energy output, this factor here. So I'm going to use a triangle to rearrange my equation. Sorry, a bit messy. Okay, the thing above the line in the equation goes above the line in the triangle, and that's my useful energy. I'm going to write UE because I haven't left myself much space. That means that efficiency and energy in go down the bottom there. I'm calculating the useful energy, so I cover that up, cross it out in my case, and I am left with efficiency multiplied by the energy in at the bottom there. So now we've got our equation in a form that we can actually use and we are almost ready to substitute in our values. I say almost because we need to look at this, 38%. If we're going to use the efficiency to calculate the useful energy, we need to have this as a decimal rather than a percentage. So that's actually equal to 38 out of 100, which equals 0 0.8. So I'll say that again, if you are given your efficiency as a percentage, you need to convert it to a decimal first before you can put it into this equation. So now we substitute in our values, our efficiency is 0 0.38, our energy in is 30 kilojoules. And working that out gives us 11.4. I need to be careful with units here. It's an energy, so it's got to be, it's got to have joules. But we used kilojoules here for our energy in. So my answer needs to be consistent with that. My answer also needs to be in kilojoules. And that was P1B.